We acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on the unceded, ancestral, and occupied traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. And furthermore, we thank the Chippewa of Saugeen and the Chippewa of Nawash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, who are the traditional keepers of this land. In some parts of Canada, treaties were signed with First Nations that gave incoming settlers rights to much of the land, while in other areas, few or no treaties were signed. Unceded land was never given or legally signed away to Britain or Canada. It was stolen and continues to be occupied and governed by settlers today. As we live, work, surf and play, we say mahalo to the Métis, Inuit and Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and from around the world who have stewarded these lands and sacred surf spots for thousands of years. We recognize their amazing resistance, resilience and strength in the face of ongoing dispossession, colonial violence and injustice. In particular, we wish for justice to be brought for the murdered and missing Indigenous children and victims of Canada's residential school system. We believe that for true healing and harmony to occur, we must end the cycle of oppression while working together as we move forward in truth and reconciliation. We can be better. We can do better. Welcome to the Permastoke podcast, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Derek. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's exciting to talk about another to, with another water lover. Yes. Just as spring's breaking, so thanks for having me. Yeah, and thanks for being here. So, Swim Drink Fish Canada. You are the executive director. Is that your title? Yeah, I'm I'm the president. Um, oh, president. Okay. You know, president, but I'm also the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper, which I've had that role for 20 years. Um, it was Lake Ontario Waterkeeper was the first group we started. I was a lawyer and I dedicated my career to doing this, to representing water. And so you had to create a group around it, Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. And then we morphed into Swim, Drink, Fish because a lot of the work we were doing was, was going beyond just Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes. Mm. So we're an organization dedicated to building a community of people working for swimmable, drinkable, fishable water across Canada. So what is a waterkeeper? Well, a waterkeeper, um, I'm not sure some of your listeners may remember the Riverkeeper, the Hudson Riverkeeper. Um, that organization started in the 90s, but it has its roots back in the 60s and 50s. And the idea is that um, the community gets together and, um, and forms an organization that really represents the water body and the people that live there and makes it a full-time job. Um, it's not a hobby. It's not something we do, you know, on weekends or after work. Um, this is all I do is uh, mm. focus on clean water. Um, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I had a real focus on bringing meaning and force to environmental laws and public health regs. So going to court, participating in hearings. But in the last, you know, 10 years, uh, Swim Drink Fish has really recognized the importance of connecting people with water. There is no real meaning um, given to the environmental laws or protections if people don't understand what they protect. And so I think we lost a few generations, particularly in the urban centers um, where pollution, sewage, stormwater really pushed people away from the water. They thought it was too mm. dirty to go in, um, you know, fences were put up, lack of access, et cetera, not a lot of monitoring and awareness around the water. And I think, I think sadly, um, you know, it became quite normalized that people thought, well, you'd never swim around Toronto, mm -hmm. Windsor, Montreal, Vancouver. And yet I knew and we all know now, you know, that there are fixes to those problems in sewage and stormwater, et cetera. And so and it's so important for Canada to reconnect those urban youth back to the lakes and to the wilderness and water. And it's right there in their cities. Wow. And so that became a big focus for us in the last 10 years. And I've that's why I'm talking to you. I mean, you're surfing the Great Lakes, like you're such an important part 
of you know why the the lakes need to be protect or um, you know why bacteria needs to be kept out of the water is to protect people like you and the surfers. Yeah, so I started surfing in about 1999 in Leamington, and right next to our dock, this brown sludge would just wash up, and we were surfing in it, and it was disgusting, and it didn't have a good reputation. So to know that there are people fighting for that in the background is uh, very reassuring and, and gives me a lot of hope and is really nice to know that there is a, a force behind this. Yeah, so that's what water keepers are. We're um, we're there to um, yeah, to do it full time. Okay, so you are are is your title like you are Lake Ontario's designated water keeper? Yeah, I'm the okay. Lake Ontario water keeper. Okay, but we are are we all water keepers in a way if we use the water or? That's a really good question. I mean, Water Keeper Alliance. Um, it, the organization started, like I said, with six or seven groups. Uh, I know Delaware, um, San Francisco Bay Keeper, um, Hudson River Keeper. Um, they all started started as a small group and have expanded. I joined in 2001, and now there's 350 water keepers around the world. But oh, wow. as we grow it, the idea of being a water keeper, um, you know, the fact that you had to sort of give up your job to do this full time, that was the mm. unique feature of a water keeper. But there's another way to think about water keepers, many different ways. Um, and I think you're getting at it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all become water keepers and really um, work together as a group um, to protect water for that? Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're looking at that. I mean, we do a lot. We need volunteers. We need water samplers. We've got water guardians. We've got swim guide affiliates. We can get into that later. A lot of opportunities for people to be involved. But so far, the water keeper, river keeper, bay keeper name still um, has fairly high quality standards you have to meet in order to get that designation. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, but it does, it just feels to me like it's such a great name and we should have more of them. Yeah, it's very uh, inspiring just to hear that title. It really kind of makes you think. So now it seems to me like there's a real sort of disconnect between people and the water. Um, you know, and I've listened to some of your online uh, talks and things like that. And so I'm just wondering when and how did that happen? Why have people veered away or it's sort of like out of sight, out of mind? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And it's something because I've worked on this for 30 years, I think I have a unique perspective. And I think, you know, I touched on it already, but I, I really do think it is because in the short term, when we find pollution, one of the short term steps you need to take is to keep people away from it. Mm. Um, so don't eat the fish, you know, and then you sort of forget about what was causing the fish to be contaminated in the first place. And you forget that the, the other fish and the wildlife can't read those signs. So they're mm. still eating. Yeah. The other fish. Um, you know, if it's sewage or stormwater and it's, it's overflowing or bypassing and you've got a really polluted little area, they put up the no swimming signs, rightfully so, because people mm -hmm. need to be told not to go into that water. But again, they didn't then fix the problem and work towards getting those signs removed. Yeah. So you had, and then of course they closed beaches. When I started in Toronto, there were 20 beaches in Toronto. Um, I know there's 11 now nine of the dirtiest ones were just closed and taken off the books. Um, so they weren't monitored or, or thought about any longer. Well, you know, for a city like Toronto with 53 kilometers of waterfront um, on Lake Ontario, not to mention the nine rivers that run through the city, you know, to have about a kilometer of water that's swimmable, that's pretty sad. And, you know, and I'm out here in Scarborough, beautiful beach, Bluffers, which was mm -hmm. the, you know, the dirtiest until we did an investigation in 2005 and now it's the cleanest. Wow. It's the only beach between the Rouge and the beaches. So that's 12, 13 kilometers out here in Scarborough. That's your, and there's only one road down, Brimley. So you wonder why people got disconnected. And then you start looking at the way we built our cities and the way we protected our water. We really, you know, whether we like it or not, we were pushing people away, mm. um, putting up barriers, discouraging them from really being active in the water and, and, you know, so for the kids who had the money 
or the privilege to, you know, have a cottage, you get to go to a camp up in Algonquin, you know, they were, you know, or live like down in Windsor, if you lived up in Sarnia and you're on the lake there, it was so incredible. There's so many incredible places, I should mm-hmm. say, lots of great places to connect. But in those urban centers, it was difficult and dangerous and, um, and people weren't encouraged to get involved. And so you lost the voice, the meaning of clean water. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we lost generations, you know, there's so many new Canadians in Toronto um, you think, how are we connecting them to the water? When I speak to them, a lot of them don't even know they're drinking the water from Lake Ontario. You know, mm. they think it comes from um, somewhere up north in a really clean aquifer. <laughs> which, okay. They don't realize it's right <laughs> down at the end of the street, the same place they don't want to swim in. Yeah. You know, important knowledge like that. And But now, you know, in COVID, I think you've probably seen this. There's a lot more people out. There's a greater appreciation. Mm-hmm. Um, of, of our water sheds and people are really starting to demand and they're getting in the water and they're demanding mm-hmm. that those protections and that information is available. So I'm hoping the next generation starts by connecting with the water, mm-hmm. like in Kingston, the Gord Edgar Downey Pier, you know, 60 years, Gord lived across the street there. And he, 20 years ago, he told me, I want people to be able to swim, you know, in downtown Kingston. Okay. And I never thought we'd get there. But, you know, 20 years later, and he was sick and we got this grant and the city of Kingston did a lot of work on their sewage and, and you know, and, and upgraded the system and eliminated combined sewer overflows and put in real time monitoring around its pipes. Guess what? It was it was possible to build that pier and brought an architect in and 250,000 people have swam there since they opened it two years ago. And wow. you think about that all those kids in the city of Kingston downtown now have that experience and they can jump it's a deep water urban swimming pier you can jump off the end and go flying three feet yeah. of water it's really exciting and and when i see it um and i see all ages i see the surfers the paddlers the swimmers the older generation younger generation all enjoying lake ontario it it really does give me hope um for the future um if we just really connect people again with the lake and the water from there they'll they'll figure it out themselves look after the little things and the big things will start to look after themselves and i really feel that's so important to canada i really like how your sort of number one thing is connecting people with the water forming some kind of relationship which will inform everything else like rather than shoving dogma or doctrines or fear down people's throat it sounds like you're really just encouraging people to connect with it, get comfortable, make it your own. And then people are going to want to bring change and make that lake clean. Yeah. And they will be the voices for that change. Um, mm-hmm. It's really empowering. Um, that connection with the water, as you know, can be quite, there's something about it. It's deep, it's meaningful. You know, you're always on aware. What I, my job is, is once they're connected and they want more, I've got to be able to provide them with those next steps, you know, okay. and, and I've been able, you know, water quality sampling, that's a high one, but a lot of people want to do that. They do want to get that water quality for their area and share it with their community. So swim guide training, but just photographs and notes and sharing that your stories. We have the watermark story of a mm-hmm. why a place means so much to you. It's amazing when you tell, I call it, we call it the watermark somewhere, some water body is part of who you are. But when you start, instead of the city you're from, but the water body you're from and and how important it is to you, it's amazing how someone else will tell you, oh, well, mine's this place or that place. And and then some people, it just forms community. There's a certain sense of intimacy there. But um, that connection, it seems simple. It seems sort of absurd in a way that an environmental lawyer who could be out there going to Supreme Court fighting the big cases would think that's so important. Yeah. But, But it is. It's... Even when I was investigating cases, I mean, the whole case came alive when I saw someone out there fishing under a tree where I saw pollution or attempting to take their kids swimming off a beach where I knew that there was a pipe or, you know, I, it just, once people gave meaning to the water, it had that connection, everything else made sense. Um, okay. So that's, that's my legal <laughs> side, but I call it giving meaning and force to environmental regs and that can only happen if you and i do it it can't you just can't flash a wand and policy wise it'll happen you have to have that connection 
So we're going to come back to this, but I need to know, did Gord ever get to see any of the work done? No. Oh. Um, you know, they usually don't know, name things after someone and we, we, he, I got his permission. He thought about it. He calls it the Gord. It's called the Gord Edgar Downey Pier because his father's name was Edgar. And he okay. Across the street. His mother, um, family was all there. The band was all there. They're very proud of it. Um, but unfortunately, Gord passed away in um, October 2017 and uh, the pier opened in July 2018. Oh, okay. Well, sort of a pretty cool in memoriam then, that's for sure. I don't, I mean, you haven't been there, I take it, but um, no. when you get a chance, and you can check on Swim Guide, you can see the go to the Swim Guide page and take a look what it looks like. But an architect in Montreal named Claude Cormier built it and just when somebody cares about, like, you just think a peer, <laughs> no mm -hmm. big deal. But when you put thoughtfulness into it and make it accessible and make it open and, and, and there's, there's, there's a beauty to that peer that you're gonna, when you're there, you're gonna go, wow. It, it's like nothing, I don't know. It's just, there's a feeling to it. I would so love something like that to be on the Detroit River in Windsor. Mm -hmm. I would love Ontario Place in Toronto to have that out in its deep, cool water off that, you know, and it's owned by the public. I would love, you know, in False Creek in Vancouver um, for them to have that type of pier. And I think they'd be more popular than the tourist attractions, to be mm. honest with you. And the fact that they're free and they're about Canadians and our connection yeah. with water, I think it would be so cool. So uh, Gord was a good friend of mine. He did so much for me. This is a small gesture, but I know this, this pier really represented the way he felt about his connection to water and how important it was for his as his muse, his music, his poetry, his art, his dancing, like he just took so much from Lake Ontario. So I'm very, I'm, you know, that place means a lot and I'm just so glad it lives up to his name. That is so cool. I'm, as you're talking, I'm hearing Lake Fever playing in the background in my <laughs> mind right now. <laughs> yeah. That's and I can't help but notice as we're sitting here discussing water, I am drinking a nice glass of water and you got some red wine there. No, it's not. I wish it was wine. <laughs> I had a long day. It's a, it's a black cherry cola. I just, it was the only oh, thing. Oh, really? Oh. And I thought, I thought I better not drink some water. <laughs> I would never drink this, but it, I'm, I'm so wow. proud of being on front of the screen today. So Yeah, but it's in a wine glass. Okay, that's hilarious. All right, I wouldn't have thought my, that. It's in my Kentucky Derby glass from seven, eight years ago. Oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> so going back a few, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the Scarborough Bluffs being one of the worst places. And it's funny, my mother-in-law just came over tonight. And in preparation for this interview, I we watched a YouTube video and, and they were helping me come up with some questions. And she had told me that as a child, she grew up in the beaches um, in the 50s and 60s. And she said that her mother explicitly told them, do not go swimming in Lake Ontario. And so there was a real sort of fear around that. And for myself, I mean, I was swimming on days I probably shouldn't have been. We had quite a few, you know, E. coli warnings back in the day. Um, but sort of just being a kid, not, not really knowing any better, but it, it is interesting to know that viewpoint that some people come to water with a fear-based approach behind it because it's been ingrained in them somehow. Yeah, I moved to Toronto in 89 to article. I would never go anywhere near the water in Toronto. Hmm. And, you know, at that time I was just starting out. Um, I grew up on a little island, Wolf Island across from Kingston every summer and we swam there, but it was getting more polluted too. And we were finding, um, you know, needles and condoms and tampon applicators floating up. I mean, that was what precipitated me to be a waterkeeper in the nineties. But in the eighties, I just, I couldn't believe that Toronto, um, you know, didn't have a really clear idea of what water was clean and what was polluted and where you could go swimming. And the number one question we had is, can I swim in Lake Ontario? Because most people just thought we're told not to. Mm -hmm. and, and bacteria is like the weather. It can change every day because a lot of it's rain sensitive. You know, you don't know when the pipes are bypassing. And there isn't a lot of water monitoring data there to tell you what's in it today. Is it safe or not? So mm -hmm. general theory was 
don't go in um, and probably was right. Now we've, through our sampling, we've just, you know, I now know what is of concern, what the indicator is. Um, colony forming units per 100 milliliters of E. coli is what we use for fresh water, um, the provincial water quality objective. Federally, it's 200, so it's a risk assessment. But now that we can start sampling different areas around Toronto, we can start finding where the areas are really, where they're clean okay. and where there's clean water and they're not impacted. The thing about sewage and stormwater, it's really local. Um, like E. coli can't live in the lake, it'll die. It lives mm. in the sewage guts and our, in our stomachs and then it's dying out. So there, you know, depending on the currents and where it is and what's impacting certain areas, it can be very clean. And, you know, and when people ask me, can I swim in Lake Ontario? I'm always, well, usually if you're a kilometer away from the shore, I'm sure you find this as a surfer, the further you get out, the cleaner it seems to be yeah. mm -hmm. because you're further, because you're further away from where the pipes are discharging or the runoff mm -hmm. is happening. Right. So once you start monitoring, then you can start going, okay, like, and if we make this structural change, it's, and you know, we fix this area, we can really clean up this strip of waterfront and create a real connection for the community and the people. And so that's how we've been making progress in the last 15 years, one pipe at a time, um, one beach at a time, understanding the currents and the watersheds and the areas and really pushing government when there is clean water, um, don't waste it. Don't like, you know, make sure that you protect that, even enlarge it, but let the public um, let the public have that privilege that we all do as Canadians to be able to connect with water because, you know, if I hadn't connected with water as a young kid, my mother didn't make every sacrifice in the world to get us out there swimming and paddling and biking and or, um, um, sailing, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't be a water keeper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that connection started, that was the gateway for me. And now it's become a, a passion and it's, and it's what I do for a living. Oh. I want to explore that in a second, but before we go there, I want to ask what were the steps in the process of getting the bluffs to what they are now? So July 14th, 2005, I was in a big fight with the city about um, what was closing the Bluffers Beach. And they were saying they couldn't do anything about it. I didn't really believe it. So I hired a hydrogeologist that I worked with on some earlier cases and we went to the beach. We did a a site visit and um, there were all these little streams, creeks running across the beach into the, you know, the shallow, sandy, beautiful area where people were swimming. So we sampled them and they were all really, really high in E. coli. So clearly mm -hmm. there were discharges coming from the runoff that was, you know, coming off the bluffs, off the streets, off the roads, whatever else. And they were just being funneled into the swimming area for all intents and purposes. So. Once we made that report available to the city and we could point that it was coming from these discharges, couldn't be clear that it would clean the whole beach. They spent, I think a million and a half or $2 million and they built major berms and they contained the stormwater, um, turned it into sort of a wetland and they kept it in its own little pond area. So it wasn't going into the swimming area. And yeah, last summer, I think if I check swim guide, you can, there's a graph there. I think it was only posted one day all day last summer and it wasn't posted at all in 2019 and you know sampled every day for six months so that's mm -hmm. a pretty awesome um change yeah. <laughs> not a lot of money and i can tell you too that in july 14th 2005 we always count how many people are there it was a saturday a warm saturday 80 degrees and there were 14 people on the beach okay now the police are on the end at Brimley and Kingston Road by 7.30 in the morning stopping wow. traffic because it's already full down there. It's wow. the demand is overwhelming and it's such a beautiful community that goes there, but it's too bad that, you know, on a Saturday at 7.30 in the morning, there's no more capacity in the east end of Toronto for, mm. um, for Beachview. So I'm, I'm really working on that. I'd love to see the whole strip right from the Rouge to the beaches. Um, swimmable wow that's a pretty you must feel pretty content about that success story though yeah i mean that that was that was my first work on bacteria and beaches so that really gave us a lot of hope around the swim guide and to create that platform but i'll tell you derek um every case we've done if you 
if you get a community of people together and you start doing water quality sampling and you start understanding um, what's in the water and what are concerning pollutants in the water, it's pretty easy to start tracking back to find out where the problem is and you can have success. I think that's okay. what I always tell people because they can get quite overwhelmed, politics, they think you go to the politicians or the newspapers. Well, really mm. what you should do is start at the laboratory because that's where your facts are gonna come out and it's gonna lead you to a success. And I'm, you know, I believe in every simple, every single investigation we've done, every community we've worked with, it's been amazing to see the transformation that's possible. Mm -hmm. If you just, you know, really take your time, do the investigation and get to know your waterfront and you, you'll discover the problems and you can start working from there one pipe at a time. Well, and the people listening to this podcast, I'm sure there's a lot of gratitude out there for, for your work and, and the work of the others involved in that particular beach, because this is one of the gold mines for surfing on the Great Lakes. The Bluffs is, is where it's at. I know. I see them down there. I post <laughs> pictures sometimes. You know, two things we'd love to include in Swim Guide to get all the surfers is the water temperature and the wave height. Mm. We know they'd be going to Swim Guide all the time for that. Not always the water quality. They should, but I think they get that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I see so many surfers down there in, in year round. And I'm glad to see um, just, I, I mean, what makes me happy is just to see people in Scarborough now collecting with Lake, collect, connecting with Lake Ontario again, because mm. It is truly, it's like, it's such a, it's the center of our, um, our culture and our prosperity mm -hmm. moving forward and our wellness and health. And so, yeah, I'm really, that's what makes me happy. And so good for the surfers. Too. Yeah. Are you familiar with the guy named Larry Cavero? Now, where have I heard that name? So he's one of even... our, he's one of our best known surfers on the Great Lakes, a real ambassador for the sport and just a really overall oh. awesome guy. But I saw that he did a watermark, uh, a video version. Yeah, he probably through Surf the Greats probably got him involved. Oh, okay, that could be, uh, yeah. They, um, yeah, they've helped, they come to our events and help um, do some sampling and they're really fantastic. Um, just a really great group. Uh, do you know Surf the Greats at all or? I do, yeah. yeah. So take me back to that uh, a few minutes ago. You started going into your own story. So what was it, Mark, that happened to you as a child that influenced um, you going in this direction? Well, I grew up in Kitchener. So we had the Grand River, and there wasn't much connection in Kitchener to the Grand. <laughs> Kitchener gets its drinking water from groundwater, believe it or not. So the Grand, mm. you know, it used to change different colors depending on, you know, the couldn't select or plating what's what's color of car they were doing um it i was so lucky that our family had come from kingston and my father moved to be a lawyer in kitchener so we still had some old property on wolf island and, and that really saved me and then when my father died young my mother really just kept that place and it's, we still have it still just you know no real running water or anything it's sort of wilderness but we were blessed to have it and um that's where i formed my love of community and, and water but i always wanted to be a lawyer so i went off and of course i went to queen so i could be close to um wolf island and then i went to law school at windsor and then i started practicing and i can you know and i, I really got into civil rights and um more and more people were coming to me with environmental issues and my mentor in criminal law Doug Chapman took a job as a prosecutor with the Ministry of Environment in Ontario. And he started just telling me all these stories and how we could be really part of a, of a movement cleaning it up if we could help provide legal advice. And um, so we started doing that, but then we discovered, well, no one has any money <laughs> who's mm. poor. We're not gonna make a living at this. Um, so I started taking some other cases, but I wanted to do this so badly. Um, that, that it eventually just turned into us becoming investigators ourselves. Mm. And so we brought private prosecutions against, and you can do that in Canada under the Fisheries Act. And we did it in Hamilton and Moncton and Toronto and really brought about some real change. And I thought, well, I can do this for a living. And mm. I knew um, Waterkeeper Alliance, the Robert Kennedy Jr., who I'd worked on a case um, for the Cree in Northern Quebec with on an environmental issue. And he was telling me I should do this full time. So 
I, I was more than willing to do it and I loved it and I'm so glad I did. Yeah. But, um, but if you ask why I did it, like if you had to get what really made me angry was, you know, when I was at the, in the 90s when I was practicing law and, and um, you know, after the rains, we would just get, I, I think I mentioned it, condoms, tampon applicators, and sometimes needles floating on the mm. shore instead of like water glass. And yeah. these are plastics that shouldn't be flushed down your toilet, but people do flush them down their toilet. And so when there's an overflow, those things go out into the, into the lake. Mm. And so they float and they're called floatables. And, um, and so it was a real indicator that there's sewage being discharged into the area. So I just, even my clients, my criminal clients would say to me, you've got to do more for the lake and the water. <laughs> and I just, I felt shamed into it. I felt so bad for my mother who, you know, who put everything she had into maintaining our connection with that lake. She was so proud of it in mm -hmm. St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario and, and our connection to it. And I just felt like it was just being destroyed. And I felt like because I had the ability to do something about it, I should. And that really got me going. So a lot of our early work happened in Kingston. Now, mm. of course, it's spread throughout Canada and we do work everywhere. But that, if you just want to link it to one little place, it's where I grew up as a kid fishing and swimming. And, um, and I took it personally when, um, when I, you know, it started to become second class water. Mm. That's a great story. So um, now if you're representing a criminal uh, mm. in a case, you know, you have interest in that criminal, you're being paid by, by them or the system or whatever it is. When you're representing the environment, who are you fighting for other than the environment? Is that why we form these organizations like Swim, Drink, Fish Canada, that you have that backbone and you're not just an, a guy who's a lawyer sticking up for the environment? Yeah, that's why we form charities and, you know, and, and, and try and build a community of people who are willing to support that. I mean, no one person can do this. My team's so amazing. Um, communications and samplers and, um, you know, operations and just running an organization is, I'm sure even with the podcast, you know, it takes a team of people um, and the research. So, yeah, that's why we did it. But, you know, who do I represent? <laughs> You know, it's the public, really. I mean, the government doesn't own those waters, and neither does our rich uncle, or nor do the corporations. Mm. These are public assets. These are owned by the people of Canada, of Ontario. These are our, our shared um, assets. And, and I think everybody gets that you need clean drinking water, so everybody really is focused in the clean drinking water, which is great. You do, and mm -hmm. we have to be protective, and I work on that all the time. But sometimes they think, ah, the idea of swimming, that's just that's a luxury or a privilege or something. And, mm. and, and yet it's not, it really is part of being a Canadian. We're the freshwater capital of really of the world with 5% yeah. of the freshwater where all of our cities are on these beautiful waterways. You go across Canada, um, you know, you follow the railway lines, you'll notice that all our cities are built on these beautiful rivers, whether it's Edmonton on the North Saskatchewan, Calgary on the Bow, Vancouver on the Fraser, Toronto, you know, we're here on Lake Ontario, all the Great Lakes, Montreal and the St. Lawrence. Amazing how water was central to where we live. Mm -hmm. And the idea that no one would represent it or push back or that people could cut corners or put their waste into it and not worry about the impacts on us was wrong um, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's illegal. And, um, you know, so it gave me a real focus. But like I said, I had a shift in the, about 10 years ago because so many people just when the rollbacks to our laws were taking place and I was involved in Walkerton as well, which was a famous case you probably heard of in Ontario, mm -hmm. drinking water. Um, but it, people, Canadians didn't know what the environmental assessment did for them or the, you know, the Navigable Waters Protection Act. What does that have to do with me and my community? Mm -hmm. And so the laws lost their meaning. And, um, and that's why I, I, I really, Derek, that's why I just had to make an effort, not just giving force to these laws, but I had to start to understand people and give these, give these waters meaning. And the only way to do that was to connect people to the water and have them find their own journey and their own connection and what they thought was worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. And that 
has changed at all. Now the rules have meaning and, and, yeah. and force. So, um, you know, who do I represent? I, not me, not my group. I guess I just represent all of our, our shared interest in freshwater and Canadian water. Mm. At least that's what I do when I step up and go to court or anything. I'm represent, believe it or not, we're representing the queen, our <laughs> versus whatever pollutant. Yeah. And yeah, I was always a defense counsel. And you're right, I, I just, I'm not a prosecutor, but when it came to pollution, I was prepared to bring cases against the polluters, despite, you know, I, I just felt that I, I had to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was speaking with um, uh, Lily Woodbury. She is from Surfrider Canada out in the Pacific Rim chapter. And so she was telling me a lot about, you know, consumers versus industry and how consumers, we really have internalized the blame for a lot of this. And we think that, you know, we better cut our six packs, of the plastics in our six packs so the ducks don't get them in their mouth. Like we think all these things, but talking to her, the impact of industry, it's, is huge and it just seems so overwhelming like um you know for the the usage that an industry does compared to one person over their whole lifetime yeah she's right about that mm -hmm. um it, i mean that's one of the reasons why you need these community groups and these people who speak up for your community because um as i say once you start investigating, you'll find out the major problem in your community, whether it's a mine tailings, you know, in cities, a lot of it is sewage. But she's right that, you know, the individual takes on so much responsibility and we're running around doing the best we can with the information we have, but it doesn't seem to be making the change we want um, mm -hmm. or fast enough. And so um, there has to be more. And that's sort of what, I, I encourage, you know, the connect is one, but then you need to start collecting. You start you need to start acting like a, an investigator, like, you know, mm -hmm. and make sure you make your notes, start keeping data. And then if you really want to get involved in really water quality data, you can learn that just like people learn all kinds of things. You can become that person. And then technology changed the world. It allows us to share data now so we can share it with different communities and with our community in ways we never even could have imagined 20 years ago. And all of that leads to restoration. And so each community really has the responsibility to work on these issues locally because the solutions are so different for every community. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's hard for a lot of people. They want to pick one issue and we'll work on it all at the top. But, you know, Toronto has such a different environmental worry about water than Kitchener does or Guelph, Windsor. Um, each one has to have that community that has that literacy about water issues and where the damage is coming from and where we need to prioritize our work. So, but at the same time, I don't want to discourage anyone from cutting those. Um, no. <laughs> those <beers. laughs> I hate those too. And I, I also, little things we do, you know, if every, if we build a movement and everyone's out there working away, that, you know, we'll see those big, we'll, we'll, the big stuff will t start taking care of itself, but it's daunting when sometimes you feel like you're all alone out there doing all this stuff and it's not making a difference. So I totally empathize. And um, yeah, and I hope we're able to um, overcome that in sheer numbers of people who are taking to the water and loving it and, and mm -hmm. working on these issues in, in, the, in the coming decade. So then how do you feel about when government does bring in some policy? So for example, right now we're moving away from single use plastics. So that is something that's being put on us as the consumer that we have no choice but to follow um, versus if it was a personal choice. No, those are good questions. And I mean, most of what the government does, and I know that <laughs> they might be listening to the show, <laughs> they probably know I'm going to say this, but like it's, it's, it's little, those are little window dressing things. <laughs> okay. And I'm supportive. I always have to be supportive of doing less bad things, but it's not going to, res you know, and I think that's what people are figuring. It's not fixing the big problems that we have, 
you know? And so, and you're not going to get the laws to fix the big problems if you don't have a community and a, and a you know, a city or a, a politic, the people in Ontario or Canada who really care about these issues and believe that government and trust that they're going to do something about it. So if the government promised swimmable water in all the cities in Canada, um, I think Canadians would be really excited about it. And, you know, they promised that they'd have these access and parks and stuff. I know that the government always says they're going to protect drinking water and they should, but how, how are we doing it? You know, um, a lot of the laws, so what you're asking me is a lot of the policy, by the time it gets made into law, it's a compromise and it gets weakened down. Mm. And it's it's not, I'm more focused on the actual pollution problem. So mm. I, I'd i like to see the, the waste, you know, those who create the waste, they own it right to the mm. end and they have the responsibility to collect it and deal with it and not just, you know, hide behind the people, you know, blue around or whatever but I, I don't want to say anything bad about the plastic movement that you know Canada is taking recently because it is it's it they're small steps but I think they're important ones um and they're a start I mean you're a you you go to the water a lot I mean I, I honestly um I don't see a lot of um water glass like when I grew up but mm. I know there's plastic all along the water's edge it's almost like um you know it's almost like just a something was leaking there and they left this huge plant. I can pick it up and I can play with it in my hand. It's all plastic. Mm. Yeah. And I, I just imagine the little, the smaller part, the micro beads that are out there. And I know the studies on fish and drinking water, they're there, but it's a real issue and we have to start focusing on it. And so um, I don't know if that's a good enough answer, but no, that's uh, great. Yeah, I encourage government to make those steps, but I feel like they do more if people wanted them to do more. Hmm. And I think people will do that when they know that it's going to result in change. And um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a tough equation. So in, in one of your talks, I saw you speaking about how we have sort of become numb to pollution or we've accepted that it's sort of a cultural norm. Um, so what went wrong? When did that happen? And how do we change our thinking? Yeah. Um, you know, I think we normalized it and people just took it. That's the way it is. And they accepted it. Um, most people still think, um, you know, the signs keeping us away from the water are for our own safety. Mm -hmm. And so we think we're protecting ourselves and our family by keeping people away from the water. But all we're really doing is, you know, losing generations of people connected to the water and it's causing more problems going forward. So that's, I know that's true. Um, why it happened, I'm still, maybe we had so much, maybe we took it for granted. Mm. Um, maybe, I don't know. I, it's, uh, you know, I have my theories, but they're not 100% true, but, mm -hmm. but we are numb to pollution. And so when I started 20 years ago, like I said, I used to be seen as some sort of, it was a little wacky, the idea that you'd swim in Lake Ontario or think wow. you could swim around, your, but not anymore. Hmm. And I think that is, you know, if I have a legacy after 20 years, I'd like to say it was that I got people dreaming big again mm -hmm. about what their lakes could be. Um, and maybe that's all that'll be is just getting people dreaming again about the lakes and what they could be that it will, you know, be the spark to restore them and to protect mm -hmm. them moving forward and the wetlands and the wildlife and the wilderness and all the beauty that comes mm -hmm. with it. Um, but Derek, I just, yeah, I don't really know what happened. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was part of the cases, the laws were there, um, the, the awareness was there, but somehow or other, it just, you know, uh, people just were convinced that it wasn't worth protecting. And, um, and so we lost a couple generations there. I think I'd say the late 60s, 70s, 80s, um, you know, were really tough times. So when I was not too far out of high school, so in my younger 20s, very youthful, um, they had proposed to put wind turbines in Lake Erie um, right by where I go surfing, right where all the jet skis zip around. Basically, 
right in the middle of the recreational use. So the zoning, the town went nuts. Uh, I, you know, no one ever went to town hall really, but for that, the place was packed. And it was interesting because on one hand, they're trying to set up wind turbines and wind energy is good. And, you know, so that's exciting. But then at the same time, oh, but we're gonna put them in the lake and basically tear up your whole recreational area. And I think, you know, I don't know all the details, but from what I was told was, you know, the, the lake, they wouldn't have to pay, you know, certain people and things because it's like you said, it's for everybody um, versus having to pay farmers and whatnot to use their land. But I remember when that was happening and I was really against putting the turbines in the lake. I supported putting them on land, but not in the lake. But I remember when that was happening and I was telling my friends, hey guys, we got to speak up about this. You know, come on, get up and do something. And I remember very vividly a friend of mine who came from a well-educated family. His dad was a doctor, uh, you know, big fancy house. I would kind of think that he would have a, a pretty open mind. And I remember he said to me, there's no point. It's already done. There's no point in fighting it. And I just, I, I thought to myself, like, we are way too young to be giving up already. Like, it, you, he literally sounded like my parents to me. I couldn't stand it. It was disgusting. Yeah, it, well, I know exactly what you feel. Um, and I know when they rolled out wind, you know, it was the first private energy, so it wasn't overly regulated. And the siting and scaling were, were really poorly chosen. I know many of the high bird areas, you know, they were poor areas at the eastern end of Lake Ontario. So that's where a lot of the wind went. And yeah, you're right about the lake. They wouldn't have to pay um, the farmer, et cetera. And, and they weren't taking people seriously in terms of their connection to the lake. Mm -hmm, so exactly. it could have been rolled out a lot better. I was part of, you know, trying to get that information because I didn't want to see green energy also get, get such a bad name that it yeah. was not follow the rules of you know zoning and siting than anyone else would because it was good it was exempt so mm -hmm. but, but but getting to your real point which is the you know that that apathy or that defeat that defeatist tone that um before you've even started mm -hmm. yeah that is a huge hurdle i've always had to overcome i like people to hear me say but no, we have overcome it many a times. Like you can fight City Hall. We convicted the city of Kingston and Hamilton for the for the Red Hill Creek pollution and Kingston for the Bell Island and Moncton had to, you know, clean up their landfills and restore the Petticodiac River and Port Hope and Port Granby are cleaning up the radioactive waste. There is a way to do this, and it it you just just like learning how to surf. You got to put in the time mm -hmm. <laughs> and. <laughs> And like anything, and anybody who's watched a detective show knows that you've got to do a good investigation and make sure you gather your facts. And 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 that will point the direction, the way. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I still get so many people, they never swim here in Toronto. They just think it's a joke. And, mm -hmm. um, wow. and sometimes I have to ask them where they are. And, you know, I know a lot of their lakes they think are so clean. And I know there's blue green algae in them, their beaches are closer. <laughs> and then I make them aware that, you know, in some ways, because Lake Ontario is so big and we've got such, you know, it's such deep and beautiful area. It does, it can mix a lot of pollution and still be clean as opposed to some of these smaller lakes yeah. some of my friends are on that they think they're safe from pollution. It's, it's just a, an ignorance. And then it gets, gets turned into an excuse mm. um, and the only way to overcome that really is you know is, is keep dreaming keep working and um, yeah well and what I'm gathering from you though today is you've went over the sort of mission of swim drink fish Canada a few times I've heard you connect with water uh, collecting the data sharing the data and restoring it with love. So really the yeah. approach with someone like that would be to, to challenge that thinking by making it personal, I think. That's a good point. Yeah. And I think it has to be personal. You heard my story, it was personal. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think we, 
I don't know if you've done a watermark. You you saw your friend. I'm, I'm certainly going to make one. I'm waiting uh, to get out there with my board and yeah. do something. So, so that's the whole point of watermark um, is to make it personal by telling your own story. I mean, I, it helped me, but I've seen it so many times now, boardrooms. I know, believe it or not, the Edmonton Oilers in their dressing room with their new rookies when they play hockey, they talk about their watermark mm. and it builds a certain intimacy. It is it's personal because yeah. now I know, you know, I just, you just mentioned, you didn't grow up in Windsor, did you, Derek? No, Leamington. So or Leamington. Oh, more, I know. more rural. Yeah. Closer to the water, more yeah. rural. No. So, you know, just when you mentioned that, and I thought of the Detroit river and now you're over on Lake Erie, there, beautiful. Um, I just, you know, I know that area and I know so many people from that area and I know so many people from Leamington eat perch. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah yeah and it's beautiful and mm -hmm. um and i know lake erie you know it's suffered a lot um uh, it still does mommy bay across the way toledo and ohio mm -hmm. and really the blue green algae and but at the same time i've also noticed that there's more and more people who are connected to lake erie now than ever and are really speaking up for it and I, i'm I, I i think that's a really great thing and i just mm -hmm. Um, I so encourage that personal connection people have. It's what motivates us, I think, in some ways. I think it's also great the community that we're working with, but yeah, make it, it has to be personal. That's yeah. how important it is. Mm. Yeah. So in the early days, before you had, before internet was around, um, it would have been harder for you to get a read on the temperature of what other people are thinking about all this stuff. So I would, yeah. And so I would imagine that there's been times in your career where you maybe think, what am I doing? Are we ever going to, are we going to get anywhere with this? Um, but now with the revolution of social media and the internet and everything, do you feel much more hopeful um, by seeing all those voices? I do. If, if we can make that connection, you'd think with, you know, technology always seems so futuristic and driven by a younger generation, which is true. Um, but I, there still hasn't been that link. I, I mean, mm. swim guide was, is such an important app and website because what we're able to do is take water quality data, you know, quality forming units per hundred milliliter of E. coli, who knows what that is, run it through a risk assessment and stuff and basically turn it into a green, go swimming, red, don't go swimming, yellow, here are the concerns you need to, you know, give charts. So we were able to really answer people's questions in a very simple mm -hmm. way through data collection and science. So that was really important. But now the opportunities are, can we do it? You know, I, I don't, you probably use WindFinder, mm -hmm. beautiful app, you know, to get your wind. And I could, I don't know how I ever lived without it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, and that's what we're trying to make water quality. <clears throat> that same sort of thing and like the weather and you can do that now with technology temperature i should know the temperature of the water at every beach and i'm going to hopefully mm -hmm. add that in um so that's the positive side but there's also there just hasn't been a lot of like there isn't it's still early it's still mm -hmm. early on there's so much more data that should be available to us as the public um you know city of toronto still doesn't um, do real-time monitoring on its sewage. So we have to sample the water. You get a report in six months. Well, what do I need your report about when you released the sewage six months ago for, you know, mm. other than to come and say, hey, you still got a problem, which I do. But I want to, I want to know it when it's happening. Yeah. So that the people who are there can take advantage. And technology lets you do that right away. And it's basically free. And you can have open data systems and let people make their own apps based on open data monitor or systems. The government's collecting the data, make it open data so people can make an app and give someone an alert when a pipe is discharging in an area mm. where they like to serve. So there's so many opportunities for technology to inform mm. and, and, and to share this information to make us all smarter and figure out what we're going to do about it. But it's still early days, um, really early days. Um, and I think Swim Guide's a great example that it can be done. But we still have a ways to go. Um, so for I, those I, listening, uh, oh, sorry, you go ahead. Oh, I was just saying with COVID this year, you know, I wrote an article in March 17th, I think it was, 
And I said that we really need to bring our public health and our water utilities together right now because we should be sampling the sewage in the cities and in our pipes for the RNA of COVID. It's not alive, but it's, you know, it's dead and you can figure out if we have it, where the high peaks are. There's so much information there. Nothing's really been done. A few cities have started, but around the world, they're doing this everywhere. And it's really important data for public health and where they should have things shut down. And I think it's gonna be really important data as we go forward, but we don't have that cooperation between those big water utilities and public health. And they need to start forming that because mm. the technology's there for, for that. And those results, that sampling is really important for public yeah. health, whether it's keeping you from getting sick on a beach if you're surfing or you know, if you're in a community that really has high COVID in your neighborhood, mm. they can find that out very simply. Um, and so I made that suggestion. And I, I know others have picked up on it. It's not my idea, Amsterdam, mm. Australia, but we're just so slow mm. to do that here. And I, again, Derek, I'm not sure why mm. I have my guesses, but it, it, technology's changed the game. There's no excuse for not knowing where the pollution's coming from and the mm. damage it's doing. Yeah. It's all a matter of looking. Absolutely. So we've talked about Swim Drink Fish Canada is this sort of umbrella organization. And now you're bringing up the Swim Guide. So this is one of the big initiatives by Swim Drink Fish Canada. And so for the listeners, uh, I think they, they've probably gathered some of what you're talking about. But essentially, Swim Guide is almost like a baseball card of every beach. You're sort of listing the statistics. So, so what kind of information can people find if they go to uh, Swim Guide and visit their favorite beach on there? Yeah, first of all, it's free. So they don't have to worry about that. They can download the app, The Swim Guide, or they can go to www.theswimguide.org and there's the website. And there's 8,000 beaches from around the world. Um, but oh, each it's beach around the world. I didn't realize that. I yeah, thought it was it's just Canada. Okay. No, it's in 11 countries, three languages. It's grown. It's so popular. Wow, We're the, yeah, the U.S. is our number one. We built it here in Toronto, but yeah, it's grown. The U.S. is our number one user, and then New Zealand, then Canada. New Zealand, all 718 beaches are there. But the, wow. the point is to have, I love that you said it's a baseball card. That sounds cool. <laughs> it's a baseball card with yeah. all the data, a nice picture of the player on the front and on the yeah. back, all his stats and data. Um, so, you know, uh, some of the beaches here we've been sampling and or taking the collecting the data for six years. So to have that water quality data um, for six years, if you go to the app, it'll, it has the historical and a little pie mm -hmm. chart you can look. Um, if there's pollution, you can report it. If you want to take a photo and you want us to keep it on, you know, link it to that beach, we know the date it was taken and when it was. So it tells us about water levels, if there's ice cover, whatever. There's a lot, and if there's people there, all that data is good for us. And so um, there's a little things you can collect if you're a beach goer on Swim Guide, but it's number one purpose is for people to know if they, <laughs> it's just the simple thing that they wanna go swimming, where's the beach here it is, is it open? I'm not gonna go down there if it's already, if you know, you're not supposed to swim. So it gives you that really update inf up to date information about water quality mm -hmm. and location. And, oh, okay. and it's really, it's our tool for connecting people to water. I'll tell you, it's very popular. We had over two and a half million users last year and we don't uh, have a budget for marketing or anything. So people are just finding it. Mm. And, um, and, and, and it's, yeah, it's just proves that we can collect data and make it useful for building a movement around clean water and swim guides proves that every day. Wow. It's so great. I'll have to take a closer look at the information that you're looking to gather there, because I mean, whenever I go do a surf lesson or something, there's certain information that I'm gathering for myself um, right. that could potentially add on what that is or, or start recording it somewhere. Yeah, and we'd love to talk to you. I mean, we're, we're Beach Manager Pro. It's gonna be our new sort of backend platform for the user like you. Okay. Data that you might be collecting. We're gonna try and find new ways that that data can also be um, be included into the beaches. So oh, temperature, for, temperature for sure, but some places salinity, some do phosphorus, wave, like there's all kinds of other data, but we're always yeah. looking for that feedback too, because, you know, 
the key to swim guide survival is people using it and bacteria isn't their number one concern. They're using it and they love it, yeah. but I think they want to report other data as well. Hmm. Well, I'll talk to you more about that offline. That's exciting. I got to say what's funny about listening to you talk about swimming in Toronto, the way you reference swimming in Toronto and how wacky it is, <laughs> you remind me of how we sound as Great Lakes surfers. When we tell people we surf the Great Lakes, it's like, no, you can't surf the lakes. I had no idea that there was such a uh, a stigma around the water in Toronto. I really, because I didn't grow up there, I really don't know much. I lived there for a year or so, but I had no idea that people thought it was that bad. So that's really interesting to me. You are such a, uh, a rebel by swimming <laughs> in a lake. Wow. Well, yeah, I'd, I can talk forever with you about stories about any city and their beaches and different stories because I've probably been at them all over the last 30 years of my career or been called by communities about different pollution. Yes. So you've yeah. seen all the beaches. What is your favorite beach in this country of ours? Wow. Um, it's unfair. I guess that's fair. <laughs> I mean, uh, I love, I, maybe because I grew up on the Great Lakes, I love the ocean. Mm, yeah. So I love the beaches in PEI. Mm. I mean, they're just so incredible. Um, I've been up in Labrador and the beaches, I mean, the water's cold. You can see um, icebergs floating by, but oh, oh some wow. of the beautiful places on earth. Um, but you know, the more famous beaches, you know, well, Bluffers is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, um, really the water's cleaned up, but it is a beautiful spot on the Great Lakes because of those bluffs and just the sheer beauty there. But, you know, for Lake Ontario, it's Big Sandy Bay on Wolf Island. It's the nicest beach on Lake Ontario by far. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it's the greatest for surfing. And, you know, it's probably one of the windiest beaches. Look it up yeah. on some. And it's surrounded by Bear Point and Long Point. And so it's this incredible place with some of the cleanest water you'll ever see and the biggest waves. And it, people use it year round. And it's a it's a beach, big sandy bay. That would be my favorite beach on. Um, writing that down. What do you said that was Jade Wolf or what was that? Wolf Island. Wolf Island. Yeah. So if you put big sandy bay into a swim guide, it'll bring it up. But it's on Wolf Island. Okay. And, and what a beautiful place. I gotta um, check out this Wolf Island for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's right at the end of it's right where the St. Lawrence starts at the end of Lake. Lake Ontario. So oh, okay. it's the US on one side and Canada on the other. And, and it's at the deepest part of Lake Ontario. It's such a beautiful area of Lake Ontario because of the, you know, the little islands and Maine Duck Island and stuff. Yeah. And so it's really clean and beautiful water. It just smells beautiful. But um, I mean, you know, those beaches just north of Sarnia there on, um, on Lake... Um, yeah, Ipper Wash yeah. Beach. And, oh, uh, yeah. beautiful. oh, beautiful. And that's where I'm living now on Lake Huron, you know, close to Sable Beach. It is unreal up here, the beauty wow. I, on the peninsula. Wow. But I will say this summer, I drove across Canada for the first time. And so I saw Lake Superior for the first time. And oh. I have to say that was hands down the most beautiful, raw almost like untouched Great Lakes beaches I've seen. It was out of this world. Out of this world. Oh, I agree. Yeah. That's why it's hard for me to say, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I put you on the spot there, but you know, at least we have some ideas for, you know, if you think they're great, then they must be pretty cool. So, so another project that falls under your umbrella here, I recorded is, the, is Blue Flag Canada. So this interested me because my wife is an interior designer and she is uh, works with something called LEED, the LEED certification. So it's a certain green standard for buildings. And this really reminded me a lot of that. This is people committed to making their beaches or marinas meet a certain standard. Yeah, and so we've only been doing it for a year. It was run by Environmental Defense for a number of years. And it's, a, it's an organization out of Europe actually and so they 
have these really strict standards for certification for a beach to be given a blue flag. We've now organized the jury. We've been doing it for a year. There's a jury that decides who gets the flag and then it's issued every year. It, it's been really helpful, particularly in Ontario um, for a lot of areas that, that were seen to be um, really polluted and they did all the work and they wanted a way to be recognized for that standard, like the LEED standard. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still learning about it and how to make it more, how to spread it out. It's, 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 um, it's such a great idea. It's the people love it. Um, we get so many volunteers at our blue flag beaches, et cetera, but maybe um, we're still learning how to really spread it out. We, we tried to get some in BC this in Vancouver this summer. Um, we didn't have any success or any takers. So we're still working on it. Okay. But it, it's, you know, environmental defense did an amazing job with it. And really, I think there's 40 we have, and we took over from them. And so we're just figuring out how to build on their success still. So we're, yeah, if anybody's thinking of having a blue flag beach, they should let us know, but they are pretty strict standards. So that's what makes scare people away. So what are some of the criteria to be a blue flag beach? Well, it's interesting because one of them, probably maybe we need change, um, but lifeguards. Um, mm -hmm. You can't be a blue flag beach without that. And yet we have a lot of beaches in Canada where they don't have the the funds or the budgets to always have them lifeguards. And, and um, so maybe that's a little different than a more densely populated area like in Europe and stuff. So um, they have to have, you know, washrooms and, and, and receptacles for waste and, you know, recycling. And they have to have water quality that um, is swimmable 90% of the time of all the samples taken. Um, they also recognized for planting flora and fauna, indigenous plants, et cetera. There's all kinds of these things that can, you know, show that they're really um, protecting and, and, and maintaining the beach. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think there's 10, I can, I should look, have them all there for you. <laughs> they're online, but um, those are the big ones, you know, okay. water quality, lifeguard, and to have the facilities for garbage and waste um, and washrooms. Those are the, those are the big ones though. Okay um yeah so and now the lake ontario water keeper you kind of talked about that earlier a bit but how does the lake ontario water keeper how does that tie into swim drink fish canada well because lake ontario water keeper was swim drink fish canada before oh, it, okay. it started but as we spread beyond the geography of lake ontario for example swim guide it just started we were working everywhere oh, okay. uh, so we still have Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. I am the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. We have monitoring hubs in Kingston, um, Toronto. Um, we still work across the Lake Ontario. And so Lake Ontario Waterkeeper is still alive and well and doing a lot of great work. But we needed to represent um, ourselves a little differently. And we always use the tagline swim, drink, fish, which is the verb for swimmable, drinkable, fishable water. Mm. And I like take action verbs, swim, drink, fish. Um, yeah. It really gets across our message. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we just thought that, you know, we, we needed to have a name for the organization that represented all our affiliates and groups we're working with. We, we run, for example, Fraser Riverkeeper in Vancouver, um, North Saskatchewan Riverkeeper in Edmonton, and we work with a lot of other groups. So it didn't make sense that they go, oh, well, here's, we're working with the Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. People would go, he's from Toronto and he's a lawyer. We don't like him. Mm, <laughs> no. yeah. Just kidding about that. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why, but Lake Ontario Waterkeeper is the pilot project. It's the model that we use to show other groups how they can succeed and, and be successful. It's, um, it's where we test all of our, 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 our ideas, um, socialize them. And it's mm. still, home. it's still home for the president of Swim Big Fish. So I still, Gotcha. I have a special spot in my heart for Lake Ontario, that's for sure. So in probably 2005, the Windsor Star wrote an article about me and, and surfing, and they titled it Wave Runner. So over the years, my friends have joked around, oh, he's the Wave Runner. But now I'm listening to you. You are the water keeper, man. What an awesome title. You need like a special wardrobe or to be, you know, a sword or something. 
That's funny. Yeah, before we came on the show tonight, I was like, well, maybe I should wear my my little T-shirt. <laughs> yeah. I had to give a speech today. I still have my collar on. Uh, yeah. yeah, cool. And and it's you know the River Keeper too. It's a great name, Bay mm. Keeper. It really has a sense of um, of the um, of the commitment. Of yeah. The to the water body. Yeah. And now. Another thing you're involved in is the Great Lakes Guardians Council. Yeah, so I said what is that board. all about? The Great Lakes Guardians Council is the Ontario government has the Great Lakes Guardians. So it's, um, I think it's been around now for six or seven years and um, different leaders from different community groups, industry, government, get together, indigenous communities and talk about a lot of the issues. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it was a powerful idea that is still growing. And, and, and again, it's, it's a lot of people haven't heard of the Great Lakes Guardians, but yeah, it's still part of, even under the conservative government, they've supported mm. it. So that's been a great board, but like the, I'm also on the Great Lakes Water Quality Board of the International okay. Direct Commission for seven years. Now that institution goes back a long time um, mm. and, and, and Boundary Waters Treaty Act um, Canada, U.S., and dealing with cross-boundary issues on water. Um, so the Great Lakes Guardians also participate in that. So there's all oh, okay. these little there's all these little groups, Derek, that are yeah, all, it sounds like it that are all trying to <laughs> help each other tackle what they all feel is the biggest issue. But everybody's still, you know, we're all working hard, but we still have so far to go. Yeah. And as I started this talk with you today, saying it's only going to be really possible is when we get more and more people. Connected the lake, yeah, yeah, get them connected to that water, and connected. you know the other thing in, under your bio that I kind of like too is the Environmental Bureau of Investigation. Sounds really <laughs> paranormal. Yeah, it was. That was 1996 <laughs> when we started that. That was uh, all the cops and the lawyers that I worked with in government, and they they volunteered their time to do these investigations on our own. Um, we borrowed from the FBI that you had yeah. to, be, to be an FBI guy. So we called it the EBI, yeah. Environmental Bureau of Investigation. But um, our tagline there was, they pollute, we prosecute. Oh. <laughs> it was a little hard ass. Yeah. But it was, that was exciting. Yeah. And now, so you mentioned the conservative government. So I heard on the news, I believe it was yesterday when I was driving, uh, something about Doug Ford supporting a Amazon warehouse being built over a wetland somewhere near Toronto, I believe. Yeah, and Pickering. It's a real, okay. uh, it's a very um, controversial issue. Um, I think the government's clearly making a mistake, mm -hmm. um, trying to skip, you know, lower some of the standards and skip some of the processes for getting approval um, in an area that, you know, it just makes no sense to me, given that between St. Catharines and Oshawa, I think we've lost over 93% of the nearshore habitat. And here's one of those areas where we have the habitat, <laughs> wetland, yeah. um, on the Duffins and Petticodiac Creek that come out in an area that, you know, really needs that. And to think that you would just, um, you know, bypass some of the rules and destroy that wetland and that, and that, um, and that complex, it just, I, you know, I know we say Doug Ford and he's the premier and he's responsible and the buck stops with him. Mm -hmm. But I mean, who was giving him this advice? Where is this coming from? How did yeah. this get to this level? Um, you know, this government, just like the one before it and the one after it, I'm trying not to look at their, their flag that they're flying, which party mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, because I have to work with them all and I have worked with them all. But I'm, you know, all of them have to get one thing through their heads. We've got a lot of work to do mm. to restore and protect our lake, whether it's for drinking water, wilderness, habitat for the people. It's all we have over the next yeah. 1500 years. I mean, this is the heart of, of you know, who we are. Um, and it's our drinking water. And we haven't built alternative methods where places to get the water. And so, um, you know, these sort of short sighted um, e examples. Yeah. Uh, of really just cutting your nose to spite your face. Um, they're really upsetting. I know the communities are working so hard to fight it. It's hard to fight these sorts of things. It's easier to fight pollution than it is government mm -hmm. policy around process. 
Okay. Um, but they're out there and I, I have such respect for those who, you know, on a rainy morning or a cold morning are out there and really trying to get their voices heard. And I think they've done a good job of raising this issue. If you're driving around hearing it on the radio, that's great. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm on the sad side, I haven't seen people as successful mm. when it does get politicized. It seems, I don't know why, but um, let's hope in this case, um, um, you know, wiser heads prevail because this is not, um, this is a real setback if they lose that. Yeah. You Can't mentioned the word it. short-sightedness. So I realize jobs are important. 2000 jobs are important, but 2000 jobs at the cost again of water destroying the earth. How long are we going to be doing that stuff till we don't even have an earth? Right. And, and, and then there'll be no jobs. Yeah, and those 2,000 people, they want access to the lake. They want clean drinking water. They want to take their kids out where they can catch a breath of fresh air and go for a run, maybe see a fish and some birds. They want that. Those 2,000 workers want that complex and want a live yeah. a, a nature. I, they need that. You can't – I mean, why do you think people are going to move to the Great Lakes in the future and stuff? Because they want to be here and connect with nature, and the food here is incredible. The fresh water where the – like this is such an incredible place don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg you know like yeah. that's why we're getting people moving here and I'll, I'll say this and i'll just say it on your show but it's the last thing is i do think the great lakes are becoming one of the most um powerful political um forces in the world because now to become the president of the united states you really do need to win those eight great lake states mm. and to be prime minister of canada you really do need to win the, the Ontario, Quebec, um, both of, uh, both provinces, which depend primarily on the Great Lakes for their drinking water and their food. Mm. And so if we can just recognize that, hey, if we just work together, <laughs> yeah. we are this incredible center of, uh, you know, power. And I think as we realize that, I think you're going to see more and more effort go if these sorts of foolish things like, uh, you know, paving over a wetland in Pickering, just yeah. insane. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that these are going to be seen as, uh, you know, again, give them meaning and the rules will have force. And I, I feel like we're going into a renaissance period here on the Great Lakes. And maybe it's COVID. Maybe we'll all just start jumping in our planes again and leaving again. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it was a real eye opener for me and a lot of my friends around and a lot of the community here in Toronto, um, but also Kingston, Wolf Island, a lot of them really didn't stay at home or get out in the winter or the spring and, and really spend some time in nature. And they have mm. now. Yeah. And I, I think they're very connected and they're excited about what it could mean for them and what they can do. So I, you know, maybe they're, maybe in some ways it took staying home for a while to really realize what we have. Yeah. Interesting how it all works. You're right. That's another one of those COVID perks. that has got people reconnecting with nature. Yeah. That's, really? that's amazing. You know, and we were talking a lot about the individual versus industry. And that story about Amazon interests me because, you know, I think about, I believe it's Jeff Bezos or whatever, you know, richest guy with Amazon. And that he has a choice, right? Like he, those people in those positions could choose to model their industry to show people how you can do it and make money and make the world a better place. But we're still doing these stupid harebrained things that just make no sense at all. And it's, again, I feel like it's just that turning a blind eye to pollution again, because yeah, industry well, makes money. So Jeff Bezos needs his own app when he thinks he's going to build a new warehouse. You should cut him up and say, Oh, <laughs> I am not there. <laughs> oh, drinking water. Yeah, he needs, they need, that's another example. I'm sure he doesn't even know what's going on there. On exactly. Earth, yeah. 100% right. Amazon safe zones. And again, when I was talking to Surfrider, the amount of plastic and cardboard and all the things used by Amazon is monumental oh yeah and to think you know like 15 years ago who was shopping online like it you know it there wasn't this 
mail and parcels going at the speed and rate they are now. So I know I, I hate to say it though. I never had anything delivered to my home really before this year, but this mm-hmm. year during the pandemic, um, I think, I think some of my technology here I've had delivered to my house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but you're right. It's getting to, I'm, I, I, I'm very aware of that. Um, the boxes and the, and all the um, packaging um, it's, it's really, uh, we'll have to take, you know, again, even though 70% of it's coming from big industry and I know your friend said that, but still I do feel real a personal responsibility to um, whether or not it makes the biggest difference or not. I just feel like I'm, I, I need to recognize my impact as well and, and do For what sure, I do. Yeah. yeah. It was just interesting to be, have that revelation though, so to sort yeah. of be able to look at the whole picture. A hundred percent. Yeah. So my wife uh, wrote down a couple of questions she wanted me to ask you, and she's curious who some of your influences and role models are for the work you do. Sure. So, no, that's a really good question. I mean, it doesn't come up in my background or, or anything, but I, I really was influenced by um, a lot of the artists that I got to know when I was younger, the painters, photographers, singers, dancers, poets. I still run a literary festival on Wolf Island. We're very much involved with musicians and, and I've, I was attracted to them and they were my mentors because they were creative. And mm-hmm. I love the idea of being creative and not necessarily following a blueprint, but creating something new, looking at it differently, maybe thinking a little out of the box. So that's one of the reasons why Gord Downey was such a influence on me, mm-hmm. you know, even back in university. And he wasn't even a big singer or anything, but he just had this incredible, um, he was just an adventurer. Mm-hmm. And then my other one was Doug Chapman. And I think I've mentioned him to you, but he was when the sixth, he was a criminal lawyer who went off and became a fisherman in Vancouver and came back to the Great Lakes and just really wanted to make it his mission to mm-hmm. clean them up because in the time when he was away, he really saw the deterioration. Mm-hmm. And so he, he wanted, you know, to join, he was an early pioneer in prosecutions of environmental laws. And he's a huge mentor of mine. He passed away about 10 years ago, but oh, okay. he started the Fraser River Keeper. And I became Lake Ontario Waterkeeper. We were both in EBI. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and, but he had a real impact on me. And he was such a great lawyer, an incredible yeah. cross examiner, um, incredibly intelligent, and uh, he just, and a hard worker. And, um, you know, they were real mentors of mine. And then, um, you know, my mother, um, she was, you know, she taught me everything I needed to know about protecting family and mm. home and friends and, and doing it in a classy way and Mm -hmm. you don't have to be she was just a wonderful woman and you know she passed away a few years ago and i have you know brought seven kids in our family and i think all of us just you know if she left us with one you know if she was there was a great mentor in our life it was her and her determination to um to work through things and not give up wow no wonder you guys spent so much time at the lake if there's seven of you I know, and we had no money. <laughs> you know, they just we got let loose for two and a half yeah. months. Scram, and go place, play in the water. <laughs> and the place looks still just like that. It's just like a big field. It's an old Irish family, but wow. you know, um, yeah, it was. It was. We felt, we felt like we were kings. But so, <laughs> with uh, Gord Downey, I wanted to ask you: Did you go to that final concert in Kingston? Yeah. Oh yeah, and Gord, Gord, the day after that concert, Gord and I went up north for a week with his couple of his kids, where we go up in Moosonee, which was really oh, nice. Wow. But, oh, yeah, I went to a bunch of the concerts, and um, you know, especially Kingston, it was the last one. Um, that must I, have been so electric that night to be there live. Yeah, it was all very sad for me. Well, I mean, sad, yeah. Truth, you want the truth? Like, <laughs> I mean it. It wasn't sad for him. He was amazing. He was yeah. the, he showed everyone. He was open and vulnerable and um, entertaining and amazing. But um, you know, for me, it was just it was just hard. It'd been a two years. It had been hard to get there, and I knew it wasn't going to get any easier for him the next little bit. And he was giving yeah. so much. So yeah, it was it was sad. I I don't know. Didn't I don't realize I'd get a 
fun. I don't know why. Yeah, I didn't realize I'd get an inside scoop on the hip and Gord Downey today. That's pretty cool. That's a bonus. Oh, back in 2004, Gord called me and he asked me to tour. I went right across the country with the band to all their big concerts, you know, and they had a little wow. t-shirts and yeah, it was fun <laughs> and dinner. They're, they're fantastic. They support a lot of charities. I think they're getting a Juno this year for their humanitarian work. They all deserve it. They're incredible. Uh, awesome. They're, they're really, um, you know, I've known them since I was in university and it was $10 all you can drink and the tragically it would play. Wow. But, <laughs> That was before they had the albums, but yeah, they're incredible people, and and it's always been a privilege to um, have been associated with them. But it was always it, to have Gord as a friend and consider him as such and a mentor. It was really um, it left me, um, you know, I feel blessed in that, and I I try and live up to his um, high standards. Whenever I get a little down, I go, oh yeah, what would Gord say? Wow, what would Gord do? So pretending you never met Gord Downey in your life, favorite Canadian band. Rush or the hip? Oh, I, I, the hip. Hip, okay. Even okay. if I hadn't met Gord, no, it's just, yeah, I like that poetry. But if you have Steve Bedini, who's a friend of mine from The Real Statics, he would definitely say Rush. Yeah. <laughs> there are Rush fans, for sure. I yeah. appreciate them a little more now. But yeah, I, th I, would, I, I think like that them. those two can at least be agreed on. Um, but yeah, there is definitely a debate there for some people. I was Joni Mitchell, Neil Young sort of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bob, yeah. Bob Dylan and the band. I still love The Last Waltz. It's my favorite album and concert of all time. The band. Uh, anyways. My wife also says, what is your utopia dream forever? I guess we could maybe simplify that into what would you like to see in 30 years from now? What state the lakes would be in or... Or, or your legacy, yeah. Well, the, the first question was easier. I can just say. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> drop me off on Maine Duck Island in the middle of Lake Ontario and leave oh, me okay. there. That's my that's my Galapagos Islands of the Great Lakes. If you ever get to Maine Duck Island, take the opportunity, go there, okay. and blown away. And there's such a history and beauty and everything else. So just it's a federal park, but it's in the middle of the lake, and people don't know about it. But it's beautiful. Okay. Uh, but you my utopian vision really. <sighs> I mean, it's not that hard for me, but I'd love to see um, Swim, Drink, Fish and the Waterkeeper movement just keep growing. And um, I, I really, because I know the results will be, I'd love to see the kids in Scarborough um, learning how to surf and swim and um, paddle in the lake and be able to take that with them anywhere they go in, their, in life. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to see Montreal become, you know, a river city again. And so there's so much pollution and stuff mm -hmm. going through there. The community still fish and stuff, but it's just, I just hate thinking that anyone in Canada should be a second class citizen. The indigenous mm -hmm. communities I go to visit and the lack of infrastructure on water and sewage. Um, mm -hmm. I just, it bothers me. It bothers mm -hmm. me that Canada is the freshwater capital of the world, really, in terms of our access to freshwater. And yet we're one of the lowest ranked countries in the world in terms of protecting it yeah. um, we're always measured as one of the lowest and so you know my utopian situation would be to go to as i say to go downtown for a meeting in downtown toronto and at lunch go for a run and then go for a, a dive off a pier off ontario place take a swim um and maybe paddle my way back downtown and go back to work. <laughs> that would be my, you know, I think it's going to happen. I don't think that yeah. is in any way unbelievable. I know some people might think it is, but I think you'll see that in 10 years. I really do. I think you'll see more paddle boards out in the harbor in Toronto, people getting from place to place, than you will boats. And, uh, and I think there'll be racks for those paddle boards and ways to rent them and just for an hour here or there. I just, I have a feeling that Toronto is going to be like, you know, a real, um, just just like the, the Italian city, uh, what's the one on the water? Vienna? <laughs> no, mm. what's the, where St. Mark's is? Venice, Venice. Venice. Toronto's I like love a, it, yeah. Toronto can be like a Venice. Venice with sup boards, that's great. Totally, and that's my utopian vision for, for Toronto, and I think it will happen, so that's nice. You In know? Vancouver, we have, we had those, uh, like community shared bicycle stands? Do you guys yes. have? Okay, yeah, yeah. so similar like to, to that. For, I'd like to see those for paddle boards. 
Yeah, but bring that model to the water. I love yeah. it. Just take your phone, just do the thing. It pays for it for you. I know where they are. Yeah. Off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh at that. It's it can happen. No, How I'm laughing because it's awesome. Island? Love it. Yeah, it's innovative. To, yeah, you got to get out to the islands in the afternoon and go for a swim and move around the harbor. The roads are all full. Like, for God's sakes, don't put boats. Anyways, those paddle boards. Yeah. That's what it should be. be beautiful. So, what are some of the uh, activities that you like doing out on the water these days? Well. <sighs> Like I'm getting older. <laughs> I'm a swimmer. I love diving. I can okay. spend all day underwater. So I still do that. Um, you know, I'm still swimming every chance I get. I'm learning mm. how to swim in colder water. So that's mm. a bit different for me. Um, but, you know, I'm still, there's nothing I love better than just, you know, getting in a boat and floating off for a day mm. on the water somewhere. Um, wherever I am in the world, even if, you know, I haven't traveled much here, but just, you know, I'm not as active as I used to be. I still run, but I just, I'm more peaceful. I just find okay. something very, yeah, there's a, I know maybe I'm a little hyped up and passionate all the time, but I feel a certain sense of um, tranquility and peace being around water. I, mm. as a kid, I didn't realize it, but every university I went to had to be really close, like to the lake or the river. So mm. I, I just, that's where I'm comfortable. Yeah. Um, that's where I feel most at home, listening to the wind, um, you know, really feeling the, listening to the sounds of the waves and being near water. And that's, um, I do a lot of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and my activities, you know, I grew up fishing, I, swimming, sailing, all of that. I didn't have much of that, all of that. But at the end, it's really just being close to the water now that really brings a certain um my mind at peace and really insightful and thoughtful. Mm. That's where I like to be. There's a book. I haven't read it. I'm imagining you might be familiar with it. I think it's called blue mind. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious about that. You know, the healing properties of just being around and in water. I believe that. Yeah, for sure. There's that book. And there was another one 20 years ago. I, I just, there's, yeah, it's, it's definitely out of this world being around water. There's something different and beautiful and dreamy and stuff about it so but that and, stuff and, seems like folklore to people who don't have a relationship with the water but when you're yeah doing your recreation out there or you grew up on it the way you did or I did um you certainly know that yeah and I'm hopeful you know that Canada makes you know makes it possible for every Canadian every youth, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you live and gives everyone that opportunity. I was so excited. I, I don't know if he even followed through on this promise, but I remember Trudeau said he was gonna give um, some tax rebate to families who sent their kids to a camp across Canada this oh, summer. Okay. Yep. I don't know if he did that. I remember hearing that thinking, wow, that's really, <laughs> that's, you know, because so many of the watermarks I hear from people are where they had the one opportunity where their grandparent or someone sent them uh, to a camp that started a whole lifelong relationship with water. Um, yeah, that's but I, true, yeah. I don't feel like our government puts enough effort into that or recognizes mm. how important this is to us as a people and to our identity and how it can hold us together as a country and we can take pride in something. That's what we should take pride in is our respect and our um, connection with wilderness woods and water and um so yeah so as we've talked i definitely get the sense of hope from you i'm not getting the doom and gloom uh yeah. vibe from you so where do you see us going or, or what do we got to do to get this ship back on course we need to connect more people with the water and get them to fall in love with it i mean that's just okay. my it's a simple equation for me once that happens they put their thinking caps on, they come up with solutions, they work together, they rebuild their connections, um, their community connections, they work on the issues that are right there at hand, so it's something to do immediately, restore, 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 protect, restore. Um, you know, that's where I see the success. I'm very hopeful because I've seen it happen so many times. Mm -hmm. Nature can, you know, nature can survive without us. We can't survive without it. So mm -hmm. it's like, in the big longer picture i'm sure you know it'll recover but will we rec you know 
what a terrible thing to think that we would be a generation or a couple generations of Canadians who grew up thinking it wasn't worth our time or our commitment or our investment to protect our connections with nature yeah. or water. I, I just think that would be such a damning condemnation of our culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm very hopeful because I think it's so obvious and I see people picking up on that and it's resonating. And I'm, I, I, so when we talked at the beginning of the show about that, you know, that apathy that people had and that defeatist attitude and we normalized pollution, I think it's changing now, Derek. Mm -hmm. And I think when that changes, you will see, um, a bit of a, a revolution and particularly around the great lakes, we're going to see it very soon. I, I, you know, the idea that we're, they still call it the Rust Belt. It just drives me crazy. Mm. But, you know, we've got to over, we're not the Rust Belt. So shut up. Don't call us the <laughs> Rust Belt. And if you do again, you know, and we're moving on and, um, and, and it's being driven by the people and it's being driven by that inclusiveness we have now too, um, from right across, you know, men, female, um, rich, poor, a new Canadian, old Canadian. I think there's a there's a unity coming about here that this is something all of us, um, you know, can unite us around mm -hmm. something really positive. Um, and I'm feeling it, and that's why I'm hopeful. I'm not not just making it up or giving you a line. I really, mm -hmm. I, I see it in you, and I'm sure you can see the hope and in, in, in people around you as they discover the water again. So that's where my hope comes from. And just remember, bluffers, they're only. 14 or 15 people there in the middle of the summer in 2005. Wow. Now there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds every day trying to do, you know, so we're seeing, I, I think, I think there's a lot of statistics to support that we are becoming more connected and we're dreaming bigger and let's hope we can dream, dream big moving forward. Incredible. Yeah. So as you said that, I was going to ask you any final words, anything to leave us on, but I think you kind of just nicely packaged that up with that statement. Dream big. <laughs> yeah. So where can people uh, learn more about Swim Drink Fish Canada? How can people get involved with Swim Drink Fish Canada? Yeah. So well, we're swimdrinkfish.ca. So the website, and there's lots of information how to connect swim guide, which we've talked about which also brings you back. We've got another platform called the Great Lakes Guide, which is a really incredible platform for people who are new to the Great Lakes, how to connect um, the stories, the information they need, the parks that are available, the trails, et cetera. So there's, you can email me, mark at waterkeeper.ca. I'm also on Twitter. I think I forget my handle. It might be waterkeeper mark. Okay. Uh, so that you can write me. Um, but you know, so there's lots of ways to connect. And that's what we do for a living. So we're more than welcome. Connect with us for sure. And we love chatting. Um, but what you can do, you know, that's the number one question we get now. It used to be where can I swim in the lake? And now it's what can I do? Mm. Uh, how can I get involved? And we're a small group. So, you know, I, I think you've heard me say it. Like, I think the first thing you got to do is, you know, take, dress yourself up, get out there. And what's the river in your backyard? What's its mm. name? Where does it go to? Where's the, your connection to water? Um, you know, are there issues there? When you go there, is it always polluted? Is there litter? Is there this? Is there a pipe that you don't know where it comes from? Mm. You know, start getting familiarizing yourself. And then you might stumble across something and you might have a question. You can phone us and ask us about mm. it. And then if you start to really enjoy it and you build some friends and you start meeting there on a regular basis and you think, hey, We'd really like to do some water quality sampling here. Yeah, that's what we're there to do. Okay. So you can, you know, it's a big job and you have to do it regularly. So, you know, it's going to take four or five hours out of your week every week to get that data. Okay. But it's possible and you can do it. And then once you start doing that, a lot more people start getting excited and you meet more and more and it just starts to grow. And I think eventually you'll have your own group right there. Um, maybe you become a water keeper or a river keeper in your community. Um, or someone you know does or someone in, the, in your family but um or your your community but that's you ask me what to do it's not a there are other things you can do you can join our you know you can help join our group you can be part of our cleanups you can do all these other things but i know speaking through your show to real people out there my my advice is to get up and connect in your own way first and um 
and then call us up and, and let's see what we can do next. Mm. Very That's, powerful stuff. Yeah. I think for one of the things you're saying that is relevant to the Great Lakes crowd is one of the things that goes on with Great Lakes surfing is there's a lot of protection around breaks and people not wanting to let other people know where they can go surfing. So it's sort of like the anti version of the swim guide in the sense that not everyone wants to reveal those spots. But I think what's a good reminder too for some people is that surfing, paddling, swimming, whatever it is, what you're saying is the more people essentially who are stoked about the water, the more change we're going to see. Um, yeah. Oh, that's a hundred percent Derek. And I, I, I get that a lot and I understand it, but you know, fishermen think about them. They get a bit, mm. they don't want to give away their favorite fishing spots. That's true. Yeah. I don't want everybody going up the main duck and ruining when I'm, you know, there's all, we all have our secrets and our stuff and the right time in the right place. And I think that's good that you can keep a little bit of that to yourself. But on the other hand, um, you know, we have a responsibility to get people connected and, 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 and it's, and I just think, yeah, I just think we need to, and maybe there aren't enough spaces right now. So we've got to create more and we've got to create mm. that space for everybody, but it was really important that we get people involved and connected and they feel like they're part of a community around clean yeah. water. That's the only way we're going to have clean water. So we can all find our own little spots and probably go there and, but it doesn't, I don't know. It's just, yeah, save a few spots if you have to, but you know, I think it's really important that we start to start to share our um, our love and our connection and and our, to the Great Lakes with each Absolutely. other. Absolutely. So, Mark, this show is called Permastoked, and now everyone I talk to, all water lovers, everybody's stoked about the water. But other yeah. than your water activities, is there anything else that gets you stoked and excited for life? <laughs> for life um i am perma stoked i'm always up um little things yeah something you don't know about me is i and maybe a lot of your listeners won't like that i'm saying this but i do i did grow up on the back of a racetrack and we always were around thoroughbred <laughs> horses and i still do love um the horse people and you know i love horses oh that's uh, right there's a racetrack down in the beaches area it used to be there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Horses. I used to walk horses out the back of that racetrack. Hot oh, walk. wow. Um, yeah. Um, that's just a little known thing. Um, you know, that's just something I grew up with. My father died young and I travel a lot with him. I'm always stoked. I, I, I do love the horse people. But, um, but, you know, what else really, you know, one day maybe I'll build an underwater school and I could just, mm. I, lo I just love being underwater. Oh, um, okay. and if i'm permanently stoked about anything just give me a snorkel and flippers and goggles and a beautiful reef and i can spend the whole day just just exploring i love it and i'll, yeah. I'll do that with you i like that too. yeah and it's a lot of fun too you can yeah. go and the great lakes have really cleaned up a lot and you can spend a lot of time discovering and it's beautiful have you done any of the courses through i think it's called P-A-D-I, I forget what it stands for exactly, but those dive courses? Yeah, I have, and I, okay. have, my, I have my divers uh, certification, but I don't use it as much because oh, okay. it's a lot more cumbersome and you're linked to the oxygen, you know, your tanks and stuff. Yeah. I, I could just snorkel and swim and around the shoals and anyways, mm. all day long. It just makes me feel a little bit more um, free. It's like biking with a whole bunch of panniers versus just biking by <laughs> just with nothing on it. I see. You know I see. I mean? Yeah. You yeah. probably some biking with panniers. You're pretty cumbersome. <laughs> Drop those off somewhere and just fly around the city on your bike. It's fun. But nice. Well, I'm really glad you called me, Derek. Um, and I can tell that you really have a, a deep love for the Great Lakes. And I I know um, your show. I, I've been you know really checking into it, and I love your attitude and your can do positivity. So I'm really happy that you had me on the show and thank you very much for that privilege. Thanks so much, Mark. Yeah, I wanted to say it's great having you as a guest. I've learned a lot, uh, very interesting stuff. And yeah, man, I know the water keeper. <laughs> <laughs>
okay. <laughs> now you gotta, that title. Now you, know me, you gotta stay in touch. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Make yeah. sure you're doing your waterkeeper duties. No, this was great. Um, very insightful and also, yeah, very warm and filled with hope too. I want to encourage everybody to check out your websites. They are really cool. And the waterkeeper.ca one, for example, I was looking over that. There are some really interesting statistics on there. Things I didn't know, like Lake Ontario is sort of out of all the lakes really kind of needs the most support. Uh, I read how there were over 150 species of fish at one time. What are we down to now? Um, I don't know that. Obviously. Yeah, okay. But I'm gonna, need, I'm gonna need a research assistant when I come on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. I need a prep. <laughs> yeah. I know that the American eel, which I don't know yes. if you know, Lake Ontario is like, you know, the great home for the American eel. They're, they're, they're born in the Sargosi Sea, south of Bermuda. They come all the way in. Only the females come into Lake Ontario. They live for 20 years. And then they go all the way back out to the sea to, you know, the opposite of what a salmon would do um, in terms of its life cycle. But they were so important to Lake Ontario and they were the biggest American eel in the world. But now 99% of them have been lost. And we wow. didn't really see what was happening because the seaway was built in 58, so it takes them 20 years. We didn't see a lot of the precipitous decline until the 70s or 80s, believe it or not. But it's it's just, we haven't really made it easy for the American eel to get from their breeding grounds to the lake and then back to their breeding grounds. They get chopped up in turbines and things like that, and other things have contributed to it. But there are they are our great fish. Um, just study the American eel, you'll fall in love with them. <laughs> Third wow. most expensive fish on the Japanese fish market. They're the taste really? full of protein. That's not a lamprey, right? A lot of people confuse the American eel. Oh, okay. The American lamprey that sucks onto fish and sucks their blood and kills them and does nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the American eel has been living here for thousands and thousands of years. And it's just sad. I, I really, if Ontario needs to save one fish right now, it's the American eel and get them back. Um, to where, you know, I'd hate to see that happen. Anyways. Save the American eel. Our, yes. our cousins from the south, we got the Canada goose, they got the American eel. Save the eel. Supposedly, supposedly when we first, you know, saw Niagara Falls and stuff, and there's all kinds of recorded history on that, that the American eel, like, were trying to climb up over Niagara Falls to get into wow. Lake Erie, but they never could. <laughs> They'd get Jeez. up 20, 30 feet, but there's so many. So they were never a Lake yeah. Erie deal. They just were Lake Ontario. That's awesome. Another yeah. great little tidbit. Yeah. yeah. Mark, awesome talking to you, my friend. Awesome talking to you. Great I'll questions. I'll see you again. But in the meantime, stay stoked. <laughs> nice. <laughs>